I again, Dwight Wilson, Armageddon Now, chapter 3, page 44, dealing with the Balfour Declaration and the euphoric hopes that were inspired by it as to the near coming of the Lord as the Jewish people were readied for his, for his arrival, his royal arrival in the kingdom of God on earth. On December 9th, 1917, the Turks abandoned Jerusalem to the advancing British forces under General Edmund Allenby without attempting a defense, a fact, that, a fact to be colorfully elaborated by the premillenarian authors over the years. The Evangel magazine carried an article, What It Means, the British in Jerusalem, in which the author recounted an article from the secular press which recorded the responses of various Jewish and Protestant leaders to the question of the meaning of the imminent fall of Jerusalem for the church and for the world. The Evangel article lamented the responses which averred that the, quote, Jews would return in unbelief and that the Christian leaders of today have utterly failed to grasp the import of what is likely to be one of the most significant and far-reaching events of this momentous period. End of quote. Jesus had prophesied in Luke 21, 24, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Thus, if Jerusalem fell, it meant that automatically the time of the Gentiles closes. In another article, probably written confidently before the fall, A.B. Simpson of the Christ Christian Missionary Alliance was exultant. Direct quote from Simpson here, How stupendous the significance of this event must be is impossible for the most intense language to exaggerate. This great event is therefore a note of time, a signal from heaven, and, a, and the marking of an epoch of history and prophecy. An age-long period of more than 25 centuries is closing, and a new age is about to begin, or has already commenced. However gradual its progression may be, and however slowly its preliminary unfoldings may appear, the fact remains that we have entered a new zone, and we are already in the beginning of the end. End of quote from Simpson. In a subsequent piece, he called the city's fall the best news in a thousand years, pointing out that the preparation for the event had begun with the advent of Zionism in 1897, exactly 1260 prophetic years after the Turks had captured Jerusalem in 637. Such a historicist view, that is, Simpson here adhering to the year-day theory, was also represented in the Evangel in an article which stated that all schools of interpretation were in agreement that history was in the time of fulfillment of the prophetic 2,520 years and that the last date possible was 1934. Surely with the British flag flying today over Jerusalem we are touching the time when Jerusalem shall be no longer trodden down but shall be the home of the free. Again a quote from the Evangel in that day. Another response to the fall of Jerusalem was to call conferences. Over 3,000 gathered for the meeting, the meetings of the Philadelphia Prophetic Conference, May 28 to May 30, 1918. A highlight of the conference was a lecture, The Capture of Jerusalem, by A. E. Thompson, who had been the pastor of the American Church in Jerusalem at the beginning of World War I. He pointed out that this event had been expected by prophetic students for years. Quote, Even before Great Britain took possession of Egypt, there were keen-sighted seers who foresaw the day when God could use, would use the Anglo-Saxon peoples to restore Jerusalem. End of quote. Another conference convened in New York in Carnegie Hall over, after the armistice at the call of Arnold C. Gabeline, editor of Our Hope magazine. The fall of Jerusalem was interpreted there also. Quote again, To us true Christian believers, it is the sign that the times of the Gentiles are rapidly nearing their close. End of quote. Still another convention, the Jewish Prophetic Conference, was held in Chicago the following year, that is 1919. 2,000 people expressed their premillenarian concern for the Jews by passing resolutions. And here, here from the text of the day is the resolution, or resolutions. Be it resolved that we pledge ourselves daily to pray that the day may speedily come when the dark shadows of 2,000 years may flee away 
and the long-promised day of righteousness and peace may come for Israel's race. And furthermore, be it resolved that we express in every possible other way our sympathy to the Jewish people in the present crisis, doing whatsoever we can in their behalf, and that a copy of these resolutions be sent to the President of the United States. Back to Wilson. Not only did the political and military machinations of the war seem to fulfill pre-millenarian predictions, but, but writers also appealed to physical phenomena to reinforce their system of interpretation. The prophets Joel, that is Joel chapter 2, and Zechariah chapter 10, had spoken of a latter rain. In a note on Zechariah 10.1, Schofield, in his reference Bible, had interpreted this latter rain as both physical and spiritual, but yet in the future. The King's Business magazine, however, quoted statistics showing that the average annual rainfall in Palestine had already gradually increased. In the 1860s, the average had been 20, uh, a little short of 22 inches. In, in the 70s, 24 and a half inches, and in the, in the 1880s, 28 almost. And finally, in the 1890s, it was up to almost 29 inches, an increase of seven inches. This was interpreted as a restoration of rainfall in preparation for the restoration of the people. But the article conveniently failed to mention that complete rainfall records had begun to be kept only in 1846, and that the average rainfall in the 1850s had been a greater amount, that is almost 29 inches. According to the Evangel, now that the latter rain has returned, the country will soon blossom as the rose, in fulfillment of Isaiah 35 verse 1. Wilson goes on, one argument raised by opponents of the restoration of the Jews to Palestine was that there was not enough room for them in the land. The pre-millenarians countered with biblical claims of even greater territories that exceeded even the wildest Zionist dreams. In an address at the Mountain Lake Park Bible Conference in Maryland, Joseph W. Kemp spoke on the Jewish tragedy and pointed out that God had promised even more land to Abraham in, in Genesis 15, verse 18. Quote from that text is, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. The speaker confessed that this territory had never been more than partially held by Israel. Nevertheless, he asserted that the promise waits for complete fulfillment, which will assuredly take place in the near future. Wilson says, commenting on the suggestion that a new Jewish state would include Mesopotamia, our hope noted that that was exactly what God had promised to the natural descendants of Abraham. In responding at another time to the question of the size of the land, the editor affirmed that the immense territory from the Nile to the fertile plains of Mesopotamia would belong to Israel in the future. He was not necessarily advocating such a move by the nations, however, for he believed that this would not transpire until the land had been given to the Jews by their returned Messiah. These discussions took no account whatsoever of the existing inhabitants of these territories. The Alliance Weekly approvingly cited an article from the Boston Evening Transcript which said that no one to any extent inhabits and cultivates this fair portion of the earth. The author explained that God had controlled history so that neither the Crusaders nor the Russians had ever been able to take the land. Everyone knows that Russia, with superstitious devotion, would have populated Palestine. So when the Jew was ready to return, it would have been occupied. That's a direct quote from the Alliance Weekly, apparently. The restoration of the Jews was now to settle everything. The writer explained all the past by saying, quote, the Jew and Palestine have been the underlying cause of the whole Eastern question that has agitated Europe for a hundred years, end of quote. He thus ignored any mundane theory, such as imperialism or Russia's need for a warm water port. I'll put in a link to uh, Nelson Barber and Charles Taze Russell's speculations on the future based on the text of their book co-published in 1877 before the Watchtower got started. Russell apparently didn't write much of it, if any, but he seems to have sponsored it. And in that book, there's a, there's a 
quite a bit of information about how they viewed the future prophetically based on the same passages that we read about here as primarily Daniel and Revelation. So Barber and Russell on Gog, Israel, Jerusalem, etc., etc. See you soon.